Good morning and welcome to Harmony Hill. We're so glad that you're here this morning. Um, if you're a visitor, well, we would love for you to take the connection card and the seat back in front of you and, and fill that out. And then at the end of the service, if you would do us a huge favor and take it to our next steps desk, which is right out these doors so that we can give you a little bit of information about the church, get to know you a little bit. Um, if you're watching online, thank you for viewing online. There's a digital connect card you can fill out as well, and we'll send you some information about the church. A couple of things um, real quick. Uh, number one, our pastor is leading a membership class right now, and so I'll be praying for him with that. And then uh, number two, um, we, our habit here is to uh, sing with masks, and then we can take those off during uh, the sermon. Uh, but otherwise, we are so delighted you're here to worship uh, at this 1130 hour and then um, I'm so excited to introduce a video of one of our incredible uh, student ministry volunteers and so take a look at the screens. My name is Alex Malone and I serve in the student ministry. I lead um, a group of ninth grade girls. I started serving um, about two years ago. I had just gotten married, just moved to Lufkin, did not know a ton of people at all, and but I felt a calling on my life to serve with students. And so one afternoon, me and my mother-in-law marched up to the student building and we walked into the middle of a leader meeting with all of the leaders, which was great. And so I um, introduced myself to Todd, told him that I wanted to be a part of it, and we met the next week and the rest is history. So God has blessed me in a million different ways with serving in the student ministry, um, but the first thing that comes to mind is that you go in and you think you're going to teach and love and, you know, do life with these girls and you're going to bless. And what you soon find out is that these students bless you more than you, woo, more than you could ever, ever imagine. Serving in the student ministry um, means to me community more than anything. Um, it means being able to find my spot in the church and being able to um, wake up every single Sunday and be happy about where I'm serving and the people that I'm surrounding myself with and just getting to do life with awesome people. What I would tell someone um, to encourage them to start serving here in the student ministry, um, I would ask the question, why not? Why not pour into um, the next generation, the generation that is gonna take the gospel um, far you know, when we're gone and not here, um, why not pour into these students that are in the most pivotal times of their lives? Why not? And I know that sometimes it can be scary to jump and sometimes it can be scary to walk into a room full of people that you don't know, but just know that you are welcome here. You have a spot here. And if God is calling you here, then make it happen. Make the jump and know that um, the student ministry is ready for you. Yeah, why not? That was so good. Um, I want to invite y'all to stand with us. And uh, so this is, our, if, if you're wearing your mask right now, this is what I would like to happen. I want us to testify to who God is through a relationship, through a song. So if you're wearing the mask, what I want you to try to do is testify so large that we blow that mask right off our mouth. Okay? If you're not wearing a mask, then you're already ahead of the, your head. And so let's just testify to how great and how good and he is. And all these songs are going to point towards him. And the last song is actually going to be us singing with the elders up in heaven as they are around the throne room. So, y'all ready? Let's do it. <laughs> Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe 
and signs and wonders I have resurrection power To the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to him forever Here we go This is my testimony Sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Good news, oh, our God will finish what He started. still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Oh, greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Oh, greater things are still to come. Testimony from death to life. This grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the rights, I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, oh, oh.
covers all. Come on. Celebrate what's happening around the throne right now. It says in the Word.
This morning, our scripture reference is from Philippians. Paul wrote this book from prison to the church at Philippi, and he's encouraging them and edifying them. He begins in chapter two to say, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection, any sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God to be a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God 
the Father. Father, we do thank you. We praise you with our lips, with our hands. Thank you for sending your son. Jesus, thank you for humbling yourself and coming to experience life like we do. Thank you for the freedom that we have to gather in your name and hear and praise you. I ask, Lord, that you would open our ears this morning as Todd brings your word. Help us to internalize it, for it to become a part of us, so that as we leave this place, it becomes part of who we are and how we live each day, not just something we heard and we forget as we leave. We trust you, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you. And um, just at the outset, um, I want to say a big thank you to our tech team for that little bumper video. So that is sort of like a sermon series that we're doing on Wednesday nights with our students. And so this today is kind of like just a little window into um, what we do over there. But don't worry, I've worked it up for big church. All right. So we're all good. The idea, though, behind this and this, the theme of today is, is reboot. And so we, uh, with our students, have been talking about this idea of being rebooted spiritually. Um, for instance, if I were to ask some of you if you could uh, perform a Control-Alt-Delete on 2020, uh, many of you would go, yes, please, <laughs> right? Like, let's reboot this thing. From a technology standpoint, we think of, you know, the idea of a reboot as returning to factory settings uh, for like a, a full reboot. And if I could stick with that analogy for a moment, there's the idea that, you know, we were created in the image of God to have a complete and perfect union with God through a relationship, but we had a virus enter our code called sin. And so Christ offers a spiritual reboot that returns us to factory settings so that we can have a relationship with the Father. The other way that we use the term reboot is in like media and entertainment. For many of us, uh, many of our shows that we grew up with or movies that we grew up with are now being rebooted, remade, right? They're taking the same characters and putting a new person in the role. So one of my favorite characters of all time, uh, no matter the medium, is, is Batman. Um, in fact, if you come to my office here on the hill, it will take you no time at all to be like, this guy loves Batman. And so this is a property that has been rebooted over and over again. For some of you, your Batman is Adam West. Boom, pow, zip. At least the first service was, right? And like, then that was their Batman. And then we had in the 80s, uh, Michael Keaton. And so for kids like the 80s and 90s, like, man, that's my Batman. Then we had a dark period where George Clooney and Val Kilmer were Batman, and then it got rebooted again, and Christian Bale was Batman, and for the large majority of maybe this crowd, that is like, oh, that's the iconic Batman, until it was rebooted again with Ben Affleck, and in fact, it is currently being rebooted right now with Robert Pattinson in the role of Batman. What is happening is the same character, new person. Spiritually speaking, Christ offers us the gift of a spiritual reboot to where we become new. We are reborn. In fact, that's the first thing we covered in the student ministry uh, in this series was the idea of Jesus talking to Nicodemus and being born again, spiritually rebooted. 
So that kind of catches you up to what we've started in youth. And so where we're going there and where I'm going today is this. For those of us who have been spiritually rebooted, what now? How do we live as someone who is spiritually rebooted? So we're going to be in the book of Philippians chapter 1. We're really going to be looking at several passages in Philippians, but primarily chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. And uh, just in case um, I wasn't uh, filling in all your blanks, what do I mean by reboot? To be remade. Christ offers us the gift of a spiritual reboot. So let me read Philippians 1, 27 to 30. Paul says, just one thing. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, working side by side for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponent. This is evidence of their destruction, but of your deliverance, and this is from God. For it has been given to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear about me. So let me give you just a little bit of context to the setting of this letter. Paul is writing um, a letter for a couple of reasons to the church at Philippi. If you read, chap, uh, read Acts chapter 16, you will read the discovery or the founding, the genesis of this church at Philippi. What you, what you see is this. Paul goes and his normal practice was to go to the synagogue and preach the gospel until they kicked him out and then he would go preach it to the Gentiles. So he shows up in Philippi, but there is no synagogue. For whatever reason, it didn't meet the criteria for there to be a synagogue in this city, so he goes out to the river. And he meets some ladies who are doing laundry, and one of them's name was Lydia. And he shares the gospel. She comes to faith, invites him to his home. He shares the gospel. Her family comes to faith, and they begin meeting in her home for prayer and uh, proclamation. A little bit later, he goes and he meets a servant girl who is possessed by a demon. And there are those that own her as a slave, and they're using her to profit off of her. And Paul kind of gets annoyed with her and casts the demon out. Now there is a financial motivation because their income by using this servant girl has been taken away. And so now they turn the city upside down. Like, These guys are just turning our whole city upside down. And they begin to, you know, beat and question and, and, um, and, and imprison Paul. And so he ends up in prison in the middle of the night. There's an earthquake and the doors fling wide open. The jailer is about to kill himself because prisoners escaped on his watch. But Paul says, no, no, we're still here. In that moment, Paul shares the gospel with the jailer. The jailer takes him to his home. His entire household believes. And this is the nucleus of the beginning of the church at Philippi. Not Jewish, but Gentile in nature. A wealthy woman named Lydia, a jailer, possibly that servant girl, and then those that have come to know Christ through their testimony. And so they knew Paul's suffering and struggle, as he mentioned there in verse 30. Like, you, are, you know what a struggle it was when I came to Philippi, and you know the struggle that I'm experiencing right now. And so in this, though, Paul, I love this. He says, just one thing, or maybe your translation, only this, live in a manner worthy of the gospel. For those who are spiritually rebooted, we live in a manner worthy of the gospel. And so this morning, what I'd like to do is just lay out a couple of ways, a couple of um, very practical ways of what does it mean for us to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. And so if you look with me here in your notes, the first thing for a rebooted life, living in a manner worthy of the gospel, we do so by standing firm on the gospel. Standing firm on the gospel. Um, in the verses we read in verse 27, Paul says, stand firm, like together, be of one mind, stand firm on the gospel. And then he goes into this amazing passage in Philippians chapter 2 that Teresa read just moments ago. And he shares what the gospel is, right? He, he describes that Jesus 
was in heaven with the full rights of divinity. And yet he did not consider those things to be used for his advantage. So he emptied himself of all that could have been claimed by him in order to come as a humble servant. Born in a stable, in a know-nothing town, to two know-nothing parents who actually were in the middle of probably some sort of controversy because she was pregnant before they got married. And then he lives a perfect, sinless life. And we discover through this passage in chapter 2 that then he was obedient to the Father's plan, even to the point of death. But not just any death, but to death on a cross, a criminal's cross, even though he was innocent. A shame and mockery of all that he was and all that he stood for. But because he was willing to be humble enough and to have love enough, the Father exalted his name above every other name. To the point that at some point, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen? See, this is the gospel. If we are to live a manner worthy of the gospel, we have to remember in your point, in your uh, outline here, the supremacy of Christ. See, I don't know about you, but I grew up in church, and so I have the temptation of the gospel of Jesus sounding normal, sounding routine. And maybe you've struggled with that. Maybe you've been saved a long time. You've gone from death to life a long time ago. And all of a sudden, you've heard it so many times that we have the tendency to treat the gospel as almost mundane, as, oh, he's talking about the gospel. See, we never outgrow the gospel. In fact, when we were um, at our middle school camp just a few weeks ago, our speaker, a friend of mine named Gary Permenter, told this story and he showed a video. I'm not, I'm not going to show the video for time's sake, but this was kind of how it went down. Is he had a former student who interned in Brooklyn at the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. And while this young lady was there, she began to meet people that were in the choir and in the church. And what she discovered is that this church is built on bringing the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to those who are disenfranchised. Almost all of them have left some form of addiction, some form of ungodliness um, that honestly many of us would shudder to even be in its presence. And that's where they came from. That's where the gospel went. And now they are made clean. And she began to share that the reason the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir is so revered, yes, they practice, yes, they have good singing voices, but it is the fact that they never got over the supremacy of the gospel. And he showed this video, and you could just see it. They, and he told us, I want you to watch this video and see if you see anything unusual. And you could see the beam of just joy from their face as they raised hands and they sang. And as, even as they panned to the, uh, to the congregation, hands raised and just tears of joy. And, and so after a few minutes, he stopped the video for our group and said, did anybody notice anything unusual in the middle schoolers? We're like, you know, I saw people raising their hands. There was joy. Um, you know, they looked like they were really meant what they were singing. And he's like, yes, yes, all that is true. But did you notice that one guy? And we're like, whoa, whoa, what one guy? And so then he brings the video back. And in the midst of all these people praising, there was one guy standing just like this. And Gary said, I don't know anything about this man. But if he knows Jesus, he's forgotten. He's gotten over the gospel somehow. He's forgotten what Jesus really did. And that struck me so much that I began to ask, have I allowed the story of Jesus to become routine when it is the most abnormal story in the world? Because I went from an enemy to God to a son of God. I went from full of sin and shame and guilt and purposelessness to forgiveness and mercy and grace and a renewed vision and purpose for my life. I got rebooted and somehow I got over it. And we never get over the gospel. And so if we're going to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, we cannot lose sight of the supremacy 
of Christ. I love this statement in, in your outline written by Walter Hansen, who is a uh, commentator. He wrote a biblical commentary on the book of Philippians. It says this, The imperatives of Scripture are based on the indicatives of who Christ is and what he has done. Now, if you're an English major or just a grammar junkie, you're like, oh, that's so good. And the rest of you are like, okay, what does that mean? Right? So, like, here, here's what it is. The imperatives of Scripture are the commands. Love one another. Love your enemy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The imperatives, we can't do the imperatives of Scripture without knowing the indicative statements, which are, what are the facts? What do we know about who Jesus is and what he has done? See, I don't know how to love my neighbor as myself until I understand Jesus loved me even when I was his enemy. You know the verse, right? We love because he first loved us. See, I can't obey the commands of Scripture until I'm overwhelmed by the majesty of how Christ is portrayed in Scripture. The second thing in, in this passage about standing firm on the gospel is not only the supremacy of Christ, but we also have to remember the true citizenship of Christians. The true citizenship of Christians. If you're a rebooted Christian, if you are saved, if you've gone from death to life by putting your faith in Jesus, then your citizenship is not of this earth. And to be even more specific, it's not, your true citizenship is not even this country. To the point that no matter what happens in November, whether you feel like your side won or lost, our true citizenship in heaven is always bringing in victory because Jesus is more than a conqueror. Amen? And we have to remember where our true citizenship lies. I don't know if you've ever been out of the country either for pleasure or for a mission trip, but other countries play a game called Spot the American. And uh, they have a list of things that they're like, yep, that's an American. And so... Um, here are some of those things that they can just easily spot in America. Number one, we have loud conversations in public. Uh, when we go overseas, we're on a train, we're on a subway, whatever. It's like, since he's here, hey, Brian, where are we going to go eat later? And they're all like, why is he so mad about dinner? <laughs> right? Like, we just talk loud. Number two, I don't know what happens when we cross international waters. We don't wear them here, but we're like, got to wear that fanny pack. It's got a flag on it, even better, right? Like, I, they're just like, they see a fanny pack and they're like, ooh, that, that is not fashion. All right, that's American. All right, how about this one? We wear shirts touting the accomplishments, uh, uh, touting our accomplishments or places that we have been. So we go overseas, it's like Grand Canyon, Spain, Mississippi 5K. And they look at that and they're like, that is, I would be mortified to be, out there just wearing what I have done, where I have been. And we're just like, I bought that at your airport gift shop. You know, like whatever. We go out and we are all about, put, I mean, just so in case anybody wants to know, we will, we're going to wear our flag when we go overseas. We got flag shirts, we got flag hats, flag shoes, flag fanny packs, etc. They're like, yeah, no other country does that. Um, don't, please don't. If you've done this, it's okay. Repentance is okay. Um, please don't do this anymore, but we have the tendency to ask this question, how much is that in real money? <laughs> Guys, their money is real. I mean, like, when you're there, use their money. How much is that in real money? Come on, man. All right, how about this one? This is a positive one. We smile at people. They know that we're American because we're just, <laughs> they're just like, I don't know that guy. Like, what's, what's his deal? How about this one? We wear running shoes even while not running. They're like, do you not have any other shoes? Um, and then lastly, uh, this is another positive. We are good tippers even in countries where it's offensive to tip. And so they can tell that we are American. See, like, as Americans as a group, we can go anywhere in the world, and there's telltale signs where they go, yep, I know where their citizenship is. Here's the question. Do we live in a manner worthy of the gospel in such a way that people who are far from God go, I know where their citizenship is. I know where their real citizenship 
belongs. Do we live in such a way of love and virtue and integrity and character that, that people just get it? They go, you're not from around here. The next truth there is this. Citizens of heaven shine in darkness. In chapter 2, Paul says this. He's like, would you be pure in an evil generation and would you shine like stars in the darkness? If we are to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, I don't think I have to twist anybody's arm to admit that we live in a lot of spiritual darkness. But the question is, can anyone see the stars around us? That we would live as citizens like we don't, like this is not our home. That we would live in darkness like light producing stars. Because, why? Because of the indicative statements of who Jesus is and what he has done. Number two, if we're going to live a rebooted life that lives according or lives in a manner worthy of the gospel, we must strive together as a united community. If you just read the book of Philippians, you will see over and over, it's like, have one mind, be of the same mind, this one thing. I mean, it's all about unity. One of the reasons Paul wrote this letter was to give them an update on how he's doing, to thank them for the gift that they sent him while he was in prison. But number three was he was concerned about the unity in the church at Philippi. He was concerned about the unity in the church at Philippi. Look in your life point outline. Unity and humility are valued traits in those who are spiritually rebooted. In fact, Paul gives us three examples in chapter two of Philippians to just get the point across. Number one, it is Jesus Christ, the passage that we looked at earlier. In fact, that entire incredible passage starts with where humility like Jesus, who having the form of God did not consider it something to be used for his own advantage, but emptied himself, right? The second example is he gave was Timothy. He said, hey, I'm sending you Timothy, and let me just tell you about Timothy. I mean, it's hard to find anyone who puts other people's interest above their own, but Timothy is the rare breed that he puts others' interests before his own. In fact, he puts the gospel's interests before his own, I hope you will greet him well. He is an outstanding young man. I don't know about you. I would love for somebody to be able to write that about me. <laughs> when I, if I'm sent somewhere, like Ben, our missions pastor, if he sends our team somewhere and he's sending me as a leader or just a, a person there, that he'd be able to write to that church and go, hey, I'm sending you somebody that is going to put the interests of the gospel above his own. He'll sleep wherever. He'll use the bathroom with whatever. Like... <laughs> He'll go wherever, he'll speak to whoever, right? The third example was Epaphroditus in chapter 2. Epaphroditus was a member, if you will, of the Philippian church. And they had sent him to carry a gift to Paul while he was in prison. While he was there, he got sick, even to the point where they thought he might die. And they're worried about him back at Philippi. And so Paul is sending Epaphroditus. He's probably the one that carried the letter to the church. And he says, here's Epaphroditus. We should esteem him because he put the gospel mission above his own health. I mean, many of you know he almost died. I'm so thankful that he didn't. It would have been grief tripled on grief for me. But I'm sending him back to you. Three examples of three people Paul just wanted to get across. Others before me. The gospel before me. If we're going to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, we must also walk with humility and humility. Because here's the truth. Obedience to Christ has enough enemies without adding friendly fire to the list. We have enough forces working against us to keep us from being obedient to Jesus that we don't need friendly fire added to that list. I did just, I mean, very little research on, on this, just looking up incidents of friendly fire. And I, I discovered this, somewhere between 2 and 20% of casualties in battle are due to friendly fire, which is doubly tragic, right? Because one... You have a casualty, and two, it was from somebody from your own side. In fact, there was one story in World War I where 
the British had sent an airplane in for reconnaissance. But there were British troops on the ground and they didn't recognize the plane. There were no marks on the plane, so they shot it down, killing everybody on board. And so the British decided, we need to do something about that. So they put the Union Jack on the bottom of all their planes so that their boys wouldn't shoot it out of the sky. Ladies and gentlemen, Christians sometimes, and rightfully so, have a bad reputation for backbiting, gossip, grumbling, arguing, and destroying one another. If you don't believe me, just go look at Facebook this past week. And I could say that on any week, pretty much at this point. Just, I mean, there's a place for honest discussion, no doubt about that, but there are just people getting destroyed with each other and just attacking each other. It's hard enough to obey Christ without friendly fire. Because the the next truth here, rivalry, arguing, grumbling, selfishness, and unresolved conflict are dangerous to our unity. In multiple places, Paul says, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. Do not grumble or argue. Have the same mind. If there's any love in Christ, if there's any consolation, if there's any compassion, have unity. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's sort of an older sort of preaching term. Um, But you may have had this experience where you felt like, as the adage goes, that the preacher read your mail the week before. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some of you ask your parents about what mail is. But like, it's like one of these things where it's like, did, how did he know that this happened? And now he's preaching on the exact thing that I was dealing with. You've had that experience. I can assure you, Brother John does not have a crack team of hackers trying to get into your text messages or into your email this week. And so if he preaches something and it hits you directly, just trust that that's the Holy Spirit. However, in the book of Philippians, Paul goes next level. He's been reading some mail. And so in chapter 4, I mean, he's been subtly alluding to, hey, let's not grumble, let's not have rivalry, you know, let's have unity. And then in chapter 4, and before I read this, just a reminder, they would bring this letter in, gather the whole church, and then someone would stand up and read the letter to the entire group. I just want you to imagine being in that group, hearing this letter for the first time from Paul. Verse 1, chapter 4. So then, in this way, my dearly loved brothers, my joy and crown, Stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Now I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Here's a very famous verse, but here's the context. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Can you imagine being in a service where Brother John was like preaching about unity and making wrongs right and relationships? And he's like, all right, now I've been around the bush for a while, but now you and you, we're going to meet back here and take care of this thing. And he calls you by name. Paul's been reading the mail. <laughs> he preached a sermon. And he's like, I've been subtle, but let's just go after it. You odious us and tiki. But I want you to notice this. This is not a believer and an unbeliever. These are not two unbelievers. He says, both of your names are in the book of life. He says, both of you contended and battled for the gospel together. But right now, I'm asking you to do this. Whatever's between you, let's get it settled so that we may, again, the one thing, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. See, Paul knows that grumbling between Christians breaks down the unity. And our greatest strength in sharing the gospel with our world is that we have unity and love for one another. Why would anyone far from God want to join a group of backbiting gossips when they can do that at work, <laughs> when they can do that at Planet Fitness, when they can do that wherever? And I'm, not, I'm a Planet Fitness member, so I'm not bashing them. Right, just wherever your zones are, wherever your spheres of influence are, right? Paul says, let's get it together. In fact, Jesus said, if you're in the middle of bringing your offering, and all of a sudden you realize I have an issue with a friend or another brother or sister in Christ, don't bring the offering. Go make that right, and then go bring the offering after unity with humility has been achieved. 
Number three, if we're going to live a rebooted life that walks in a manner worthy of the gospel, we must do so by showing our commitment even in the face of suffering. Verses 29 and 30, the first half we like, the back half we do not like. First half, Paul says, now look, it is a gift from God for you to believe. And we're like, yes, that's what I'm talking about. And also for you to suffer. Whoa. No, thank you. Okay, everybody, let's memorize Philippians 1, 29a and leave off B, right? Like, it's a gift for us to believe and suffer just as you've seen me suffer. And even now I am and you heard about it. I don't know about you. I don't like to suffer. But I was thinking about it this morning on the way to church. Many of us in this room are praying for God to do revival in our land and in our world, right? But what if God's answer to that prayer is Christian suffering? Because for whatever reason, wherever there's persecution and Christian suffering, the gospel explodes. Paul, in fact, in chapter 1, <laughs> he is in prison. Remember, one of the reasons he wrote this letter is to give an update on what he's doing. And what he's doing is, is he went to a town, as he was wont to do, preached the gospel till people said, please don't do that anymore. And he continued to preach the gospel till they put him in prison. And I imagine the person reading this letter, getting the update on Paul, is like, he's back in prison, y'all. Bless his heart. I wish he'd find a town that could get along with him. You know, like, and he's like, but then the next statement is like, yeah, I'm in prison, but guys, it's going great. Like, what? It's going great. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like every day they bring somebody in and they chain me to him. And now they're my captive. And I tell them all day about what Jesus has done, how he changed my life, the work he's doing around the world. Told about you guys, you know, like. And in fact, the entire Praetorian Guard is aware of this situation. Now, Paul doesn't say this, but I do kind of wonder in the background, like every morning, like, all right, who's going to uh, guard Paul today? One, two, three, shoot, right? Like, but he's like, guys, it's going great. Here's the truth. Our commitment to the gospel mission must supersede our circumstances. If we're going to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, our circumstances can't dictate how willing we are to be on mission. Can't all, we can't be like, yeah, it's good when things are good, but when life stinks, I'm no longer on mission. I checked out. Paul's like, hey, I'm in prison. It's going great. I don't know how many of us would have that experience, right? Like right before COVID like shut down the world, like we took a group of students to the Dominican Republic and like halfway through while we were there, um, President Trump came on and said, we're shutting down travel from Europe. And I, in case you don't know geography, Dominican is not in Europe, but it's still scary when you are like the leader of, of teenagers and, you know, the president just said, we're, we're stopping some travel flow uh, happening. And then like that same night, Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz essentially tested positive and shut down sports. And you're just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So in my mind, I'm thinking, what if we get um, quarantined? Uh, here in the Dominican or in Miami where we fly back in, and it's like 14 days of like isolation. Like, would my circumstances make me grumble? Or would I be like, hey, every day there's a new nurse that comes in here that I can share the gospel while she's ch checking my temperature. Every day I look through the glass at somebody else quarantined and we can figure out how to share the gospel, right? Like, circumstances don't dictate the mission. In fact, it could be that the circumstances were caused so that the mission can be moved forward. The last point here would be this. We need a paradigm shift in what we truly value. Philippians is chock full of quotable verses. I mean, I encourage you to read it this week. Um, and you're like, oh, I didn't know all of these were in Philippians. Well, Paul, while he's talking about being in prison, he says this, look, um, guys, I just want you to be aware that if they decide to kill me or execute me, um, I'll be with Jesus. So I'm going to put that in the pro column. But if I get to continue living, uh, then I get to do ministry with you and, and expand the gospel mission. And so that's also in the pro column. So basically, guys, what I'm saying is this is a win-win for me. This is a win for To die 
is gain for me and to live is Christ. I mean, that's just, that had to be as shocking in the early 60s. I mean, like 60 years after Christ was born, when they read this letter as it is in 2020. Like, what? To die is gain? And it's not like Paul was being morbid or that he was you know, looking for death. He was just like, I mean, I'll be free. My race will be done if they end it because of the gospel. But to stay here is no trouble either. I'm happy to share the gospel and invest in you. And then a little bit later, um, he's writing about these Judaizers who, uh, I mean, you just got to love Paul. He's so blunt. I mean, he called out two, two ladies in church. But he also says, hey, beware the dogs who are going to try to draw you away from the true gospel. And he's like, and if they try to tell you what the gospel is all about, like physical things, like your spiritual resume, he goes, tell them to back off. I've got a better spiritual resume than anybody. But all that stuff I used to consider gain, yeah, that's loss. That's garbage is literally what it's saying. He's like, I would rather trade my Pharisee title to the dumpster to get Christ every day of the week. And so it brings us to this question, if we're going to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, are there things in my life, are there things in your life that you go, I value them, if I'm being just dead honest, I value them more than Jesus? I'm going to give you a very petty example. I know it's petty, but we're human, so most of us, what we have in our mind is probably going to be petty anyways compared to Christ. And so when I was in college, I was wrestling with this. Like, what is the one thing if Jesus asked me to give it up that I'm just like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. And again, I'm forewarning you. This is a really petty thing. I was in college. In my mind, I was like, the only thing that I just really don't want to give up is my PlayStation. I told you it was petty, but, you know, don't judge, Right. But like, and this is PlayStation 1, so I mean, this is a long time ago, right? But, and so I went on this trip and with some friends, and I was expecting a very important phone call on the home phone, because cell phones were only for emergencies, if you remember those days. And so I'm calling my answering machine, which you can go to a museum and see what that is, and, and calling it to see if this message had come in. And every day I would call, and I hadn't got the message, hadn't got the message. And on the way home, I'm calling, and it just rings and rings and rings. And I don't know why, but I just knew. I was like, our apartment's been, been robbed. There's the only reason why the phone is not going to voicemail. Sure enough, I go home, I open the door. We had been robbed, and they had stolen my PlayStation. No! But very quickly, probably within like a matter of minutes after somebody was like, are you serious? I realized I could survive. In fact, my studies probably improved. <laughs> Later that semester, my relationship, we probably talked more in our apartment with my roommates that semester. We, I probably read my Bible a little bit more that semester. Like, like the one thing, and I know it's so dumb, but like honestly, anything compared to Jesus is like a PlayStation being stolen. And, but it's real to us, but to the outsider, it's like, just let it go. And the question is this, is what do we value more than Jesus? And if there's anything, we've got to ask him to remove it. And that's a hard prayer. But if we want to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, we've got to stand firm on the gospel. We've got to strive together as a unified community with an attitude of humility. And we must be committed to the mission despite our circumstances. And so I'm going to close with this. On the bottom or the last part of your life point outline, I have five, five questions. And so I would encourage you to do this. I would encourage you this week to maybe take one question a day during the week, read a little bit of Philippians, and then ask yourself these questions. Am I living in a manner worthy of the gospel? Have I become desensitized to the majesty and supremacy of Jesus? Would others characterize me as a Timothy who puts others' needs before his own, or a centiki who had to be called out because of disunity? Do I value following Jesus over everything else I might count as gain? And how might my current circumstances be used for God's mission? I want to pray for us as we get ready to dismiss and just ask the Father to encourage us to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. But before I do, let me just mention three things before we walk out the door. Number one, 
Um, if you would like to understand what it means to be spiritually rebooted, to be born again, to put faith in Jesus, would you go to the Next Step desk, which is right out here? Just make time to do that and start that process. You can do that for salvation, baptism, how to become a member, any member, I mean, any uh, information about any of the ministries here at the church. Number two, we're going to be taking our offering and tithes at the door. Thank you so much for your generosity and giving to propel the mission forward despite financial difficult circumstances. Um, and then number three, if there's, if there's anything that the Lord has laid on your heart through this, would you be obedient to it this week and live in a manner worthy of the gospel? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus who is the supreme. Lord, he loved us to the fullest. He forgave us to the utmost. He provides grace unlimited. His name is above every name. And Lord, help us to even start today, not wait till the end of days, but that we would kneel before you and that we would confess Jesus is Lord. Father, for those that are your kids here, I pray that we would be obedient to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, of this good news. Help us to be unified. Help us to propel the mission forward. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I hope you have a great week.